Let's talk the girl who died. That Stark girl goes Viking. Hi, Miguel here. Spoiler alert, spoilers ahead, spoilers, warning, spoilers, and go. Another cliffhanger that gives us a death that's not a death. Three stories into the series, we're three for three in death cliffhangers, but this one's different. It's a twist. It's a real death with a real resurrection. Oh, we don't even have to wait for part two to see that she's not dead anymore. Now, the first two death cliffhangers in series nine were foolers. They, they, they were tricking us. It looked like the people died, but you tune in a week later and... <laughs> this time, however, this time when death comes a knocking, death walks right in and pulls up a chair and sits a while. The episode lives up to the title, Series 9, Episode 5, The Girl Who Died Actually Dies. For a couple of minutes, anyway. Written by showrunner Stephen Moffat and Jamie Matheson. Matheson wrote two of my favorite episodes from the last series, Mummy on the Orient Express, and Flatline. Okay, so the Viking girl dies, but her death is rescinded before the fade-out. Happy ending, right? No. We know what happens when Superman flies backwards around the Earth and reverses time. Well, he keeps Lois from dying, but no good will come of it. Next week, we'll see the consequence. Zod and his gang escaping from the Phantom Zone, or something like that. Now, near the beginning of the episode, Clara questions the doctor and asks him to clarify, or clarify, the precise rules for when he can and cannot intervene to change history. Because face it, every time the doctor does anything, he's changing history. Well, for that matter, you and I too. We, we change history all the time. Just by watching this video, you have changed history. If you want to change history a little more, like, comment, subscribe. Click on something in the end screen. Even better, get some of your friends to subscribe to Nicola. Get 10 of them. And now back to our review. Not changing history, or at least fixed points in time, is the Doctor's equivalent of Star Trek's prime directive. But the Doctor will not give Clara a crisp definition of the boundary, just a general principle. Be gentle. It's okay to cause ripples in time, but not tidal waves. It's a judgment call. The issue came up in last week's episode, Before the Flood. Bennett berates him for not saving O'Donnell, but the Doctor refuses. He will not risk the disruption. But this episode? By the end of this episode, the Doctor is suddenly willing to risk a tsunami by reviving the dead Ashilder, played by Maisie Williams. Ashilder, a brave Viking lass who saves her village at the cost of her own life. The Doctor infuses her with alien tech that repairs her and apparently will make her immortal. Tsunami warming. If a shielder is truly immortal, that means she's alive in our era, in which case I wonder if a shielder knows anything about Tumblr or Flickr or Grinder. You know, if you put the E's back into her name, a shielder is actually a shielder. But she's not a fighter. She's a storyteller. And I love that the writers gave a scene to Clara and a shielder together. They are marvelous together. There's a spin-off for you, the, the Clara and a shielder chronicles. Director Ed Buzzleget gives the episode grand visual panache. He opens with a stunning, extreme close-up on Clara's eyeball as she floats through space, closes with an equally stunning time-lapse of a shielder enduring through the ages, William subtly changing her face from joy to gloom at the prospect of her own immortality. May I just say a, a word about the production of this entire series? It doesn't get nearly the attention it deserves. Sets, props, wardrobe, makeup, hair, monsters, it's all first-rate. So here are the villains of the week, Odin and the Mire. Under their armor, the Mire are toothy and monstrous. Odin, played by David Schofield, well, what you see is a holographically projected Norse god face. It conceals something apparently so horrible, or possibly something that wasn't finished in time for filming, that the camera cuts away before we even get a good look at it. Ooh. The Mire are warriors, armored, cold. They kill their enemies and extract their adrenaline and testosterone. Well, that breaks new ground for a kitty show, don't it? The Adrenaline Testosterone Cocktail. High-tech cannibalism and a good excuse to explain the endocrine system to the kitties. We know the Meyer must be alien because in humans, oral administration of adrenaline and testosterone is not very effective. I'm actually surprised it works at all in aliens. The doctor's in fine form, lots of good jokes. When the soldiers of the village are all taken away, he laments that all that's left are the farmers, fishermen, and web designers. The doctor's moral calculations are fascinating. The Meyer aren't threatening the entire planet. They just want to wipe out one little village. If he lets them do it, they'll go away. It'll save the planet. Sounds a little Neville Chamberlain to me. But if he helps the village defeat the Meyer, well, they'll come back in force, and that will threaten the planet. His solution 
is not to defeat them, but to humiliate them and blackmail them. Okay, the plan requires electromagnets, which requires electricity. And the TARDIS is two days' journey away. Luckily, the Vikings have a supply of electric eels. It's a huge leap to imagine that Vikings keep electric eels on hand. The habitat of the eel is in the rivers of South America. And, and eels are capable of high voltage, but only for a very short duration. Anyway, it works, because it's Doctor Who science. Side note, anybody else find it unlikely that an alien from a thousand years ago would be intimidated by yakety sacks? The Benny Hill theme? Small point. Has there ever been an era in this show that put so much energy into honoring its own legacy? Maybe it's because Stephen Moffat presided over the 50th anniversary. Or maybe he's just a super fan. But it, didn't it used to be that when the Doctor regenerated, the old guy was gone? Just gone? Except for those rare specials that featured multiple Doctors. I think the practice was regenerate and don't look back. But Moffat is constantly working in props and catchphrases, bits of wardrobe, even clips of former Doctors. And he threw one of those into this episode. Took my breath away. Made my eyes water. You know what I'm talking about. But even without the clips and the callbacks and the dialogue and the yo-yo and the jelly babies, Peter Capaldi, just with his performance alone, manages to channel and echo elements of many of the former Doctors. The wisdom of the first Doctor, the whimsy of the second, the daring do of the third, the sly mischief of the fourth, the mournfulness of the ninth, the compassion of the tenth, the goofiness of the eleventh, the world weariness of the war Doctor. Capaldi's extraordinary. His emotional tonal shifts within a, a single episode are breathtaking. I've said my favorite Doctor is always the current one, but this time I think I mean it. So, the series has a new immortal. She'll be back next week in a different time period, and if she survives, the woman who lived, potentially, she could be a recurring regular, like the master, Professor Song, Katie Lethbridge-Stewart. Time will tell. Until next time, I'm Mikola. <laughs> DVD Extras. Let's start with some of your comments. DVDX rules notice that the Doctor's Guitar Amp is made by Magpie Electricals. That's a company first seen in the 10th Doctor episode, The Idiot's Lantern. Magpie Electrical sold televisions, and while Mr. Magpie himself met an unfortunate end in the episode, his company lives on. It's become a recurring brand on the show. It appears in multiple episodes, even in spin-offs. You can even buy merch for it. I wondered if the Doctor had ever crossed his time stream in the past and caught a glimpse of himself. Laura Terrell, Tone 720, Breadcrumb, they all pointed out that the 9th Doctor and Rose crossed their timeline and saw themselves back in Father's Day. And seeing two doctors on screen at the same time is a clue to the question I posed of how can the doctor be out of the action for 200 years and still be on the show every week for new adventures? Several folks answered that one, including Louis Pinto, Jack of Trades 80, only one Takin. He's a time traveler. He crosses his own time stream all the time. Eric Peter Schwartz brought up a parallel example, fitting since this was Future Week. Because of time-crossing paradoxes in Back to the Future 2, at one point there are actually four DeLoreans in Hill Valley. As for the bootstrap paradox, several of you, including Dylan Shadowstar, pointed out that it's been used before by Moffat himself, most famously in Blink. I think you had mixed feelings about the Doctor breaking the fourth wall. Dan O'Brien thinks the opening monologue in Listen was also a case of the Doctor breaking the fourth wall, but I disagree with that. Daniel Waxerly and Mr. Z71 pointed out that the fourth Doctor did it too. Even the sonic screwdriver won't get me out of this one. But that was just a throwaway line, not a whole monologue. The director of this story, Ed Basil Gett, I think he started his career as a musician, lead guitarist for the Vapors, turning Japanese. I really think so. And his great-great-grandfather in the 19th century designed the sewers under London. There is a cottage industry on the web dedicated to uncovering Easter eggs and references in Doctor Who episodes. If you're into that level of lore, here's a terrific blog I can recommend to you. It's called Anglophenia. It's by Fraser McAlpine, and he posts after every episode. There's a link in the description. And now it's time for some end screen treats for your further viewing pleasure. This, a collection of other reviews for this episode, if you want to compare notes. And this, that's a playlist of my previous reviews. Oh, and if you're wondering how much power you can get from an electric eel, you might want to watch this. And lastly, I have a review of the new Steve Jobs movie. I think it's a good film, but the Steve I knew isn't in it. Uh, oh, yes. One more thing. If you want more Mikola, please subscribe. Bye now.